Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to another episode of our BCG Conversation Midlands Matters podcast. I'm Martha Jennings, an account manager at BCG Birmingham. I'm Johnny Hodges, an account manager at BCG Birmingham. And today we're really, really pleased to be joined by our guest, Paul Butters, Head of Communications at Midlands Connect. Thank you. So Paul, I thought it would be a relevant place for us to start, if you mind just opening with explaining a bit about the work of Midlands Connect. You know, some of our our listeners might be outside of the Midlands and not, not aware of, of the work that you guys do. So we'd really appreciate if you could just, yeah, talk us through it. Of course. Bit. So the way I explain it to my mates down the pub when they go, what what do you actually do? So we're, we're a bit like Transport for the North, but for the Midlands. So we're fully funded by the government. So we're given about £5 million by the DFT every year. And our job is whenever a kind of fiscal event comes up, so a budget, an autumn statement, a spending review, our job is to write them a letter, basically. Quite expensive for a letter, but that's our job. Um, so we write them a letter saying, these are the projects that we would we would recommend that you did, uh, because we spend all of our time kind of researching and recommending projects. So we work with local councils, HS2, National Highways, the kind of soup of organisations you've probably heard of. And we recommend to the government what projects they should build. So that's our job in a nutshell. So I'd explain it to me, Mum. <laughs> that is a good way to explain it. Thank uh, you. And tell us a little bit about your role um, in Midlands Connect communications. Have you always wanted to be in communications? Was it something that you fell into? Did you work towards it? How, how, how does that look like? I wanted to be a teacher once, but I realised I didn't particularly like kids. <laughs> so I was like, this probably ain't for me, really. Uh, and then I did student radio and I was like, I couldn't do this because you'd end up being on like, the night shift. So I mean, after, uh, after university, I went to politics. So I worked in politics for nearly a decade. Uh, so if you want to talk about funny stories in politics, I can probably do that. <laughs> I definitely do. Um, so I, I was in that for about a decade. Uh, I used to commute from Wolverhampton down to London every day. Wow. Got the 4.55 a.m. train in the morning. Yeah. Absolute jokes, isn't it? Anyway, um, so I did that for about a decade. And then my wife went, you probably need to sort your life out, basically. So uh, I went to go work for the CBI. And then did about 18 months with them and then went to go up for Midlands Connect. Uh, there's four of us in our team. We do kind of public affairs, uh, kind of government liaison, uh, and we do straight comms as well. So we put our press releases to talk to MPs, to SPADs and ministers and that type of thing. So that's our team. It must be quite a different um, environment to you, for you to be in now in comparison to then the 4.55. <laughs> I mean, down, I have to be honest, I like working from home because I can get up about <laughs> quarter to nine. I put my daughter on, my wife takes my daughter to work, uh, to nursery and then goes off to work and then I go back to bed for about an hour. So that's happy times. Um, but yeah, so like used to get the 4.55 uh, and the, the people at Wolverhampton Station were really nice. They used to leave the newspapers on the platform for me. So that was very oh, nice of them. But yeah. Uh, it's a different change of pace, really. It's, it's nice. It's very different. And I'm, I'm, I never worked with local government. I never worked in kind of the built environment, that type of thing. So I used to deal with MPs and, you know, who's up, who's down and that type of thing. Whereas now it's, it's a whole new, new world, really, basically. Yeah, that's really interesting. And as part of this, as, as you just said it there, like new world of word that you're in, what do you, would you say is the role of like good political engagement in the work that Midlands Connect does? So I mean, that's a good question. I mean, the honest answer is like, you can have the best project in the world. And I'm sure many of your clients do. And on a daily basis, you're probably giving them good advice. But we hope. Uh, well, I'm sure. <laughs> Touch wood. Um, but like the honest answer is like good political engagement is the final 10% because, you know, we're in a world where you can't just build roads for road's sake anymore. Uh, and we're doing a lot of work at the moment on, on the kind of RIS, which is the road improvement strategy, which the government are going to announce in about a year or so. And you can't just build a road for a road's sake. So it's what's the benefit and good political engagement gets you that final 10%. Over the last couple of years, we've had about 200 million pounds of transport projects announced, uh, thanks to our work. So we're we're doing all right. Um, But, you know, good political engagement is the thing that gets you over the top, basically, I think, because, you know, politicians are relatively time poor. And it's how do you get your project from one of 20 to the top of the list? So you mentioned there that good political engagement is about 10%. What would you summarise as, say, the other approx 90%? Four, you're going to make me try and work out my numbers here. Um, no, don't worry uh, so about that, because I couldn't work out Oh, I'd be either. dreadful. I've only got a C and G, so <laughs> emails. Um, so the only answer is you need a good business case. No matter, no matter what no matter what you have, If it, you can have the best political case in the world, but as long as you don't have a strong mm-hmm. business case, it doesn't work. 
you need a strong strategic case. Uh, you need to be quite ruthless with that, is that you can't just put 20 projects up and, you know, I will see people in different parts of the country putting up 10 business cases. Uh, and you actually have to be quite ruthless and say, these are our 10 or 15 priority schemes for the next 15 years. Uh, and the government quite like that if you're, if you're relatively ruthless. Uh, and then you need a good strategic case. So what's the strategic rationale for doing what you're doing? You know, just building you know, a new park or something, brilliant, or a new shopping centre, great, but what's the strategic case behind it? Why should they give you money than somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And then there's the political case at the end. It's the, the icing on the top, really. It's like, what, what, who benefits? Why do they benefit? And what's for politicians? What's in it for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and is there like a certain set of criteria then that you would like standardisedly work from? So, so the only answer like is like, you use the gut test, to be perfectly yeah. frank, that you probably get as well. Like you'll get a project come in I'm sure, and you'll go, there you go, thank you very much. Mm. And it's because, and like, that, the honest answer is, if you, if you kind of think about it and boil it down, it's, um, let's pick a train line, for example, let's pick a hypothetical train line, where does it go? Uh, where, are the, where, are the, where are the benefits located? Um, uh, what's the narrative? So does the project that you're, you're pushing or selling or whatever, does that fit in with the government's priorities? So, you know, it was leveling up. Before that, it was regional development. And before that, it was like building Britain or something, wasn't it, if I remember? Whereas now it's um, Rishi's five points. So like, I go around in my office and go, can you name all five points? Please don't test me. Um, <laughs> but, but, but point three is uh, build the economy. So everything at the moment, you have to crowbar into point three. It's like building the economy. So it's, does your project fit in with the government zeitgeist? And can you show them them giving you however much millions will will deliver it, and that's and that's how you get from A to B the quickest time possible, really. And you mentioned there about how you know you look to see how your projects can fit into the government agenda of the time. But is there ever a case whereby you attempt, even at a local level, to work that the other way round to be like, I think you know we propose this project or we think this is really good. Is there ever a situation whereby you would present that to politicians, even if it doesn't necessarily align with their of course, bigger like, picture? Yeah. So there are there are certain um, local councils that have different views on roads. Is probably a very good example. Um, and we'll say we would build this road, and this is why we would build it. And there are certain local councils, political makeups, who go, "We're all right, thank you. That's not that's not for us." Mm. Um, and uh, they'll they'll with they'll reject the money even in one case recently yeah. uh where they'll go I don't, we don't want the money for a road it's not that's not where we are um and that's and that's their prerogative um sometimes you know the only answer is you have to be really honest with these people and engage them at the earliest possible opportunity to say look you know here's the opportunity is that something you want to get involved in so hopefully you won't end up going down the track of doing lots of work and then someone going mm -hmm. this isn't for us um, so we will we will come in and say, you know, we try and regularly meet all the leaders. So I think you had Jim in. He's on another podcast. Um, <laughs> so we'll probably meet people like Jim and say, Jim, these are the projects we're working on. You know, are you, are you happy with them? Are you, you know, these are the things we're going to do. So we're working with them on a, on a train line at the moment that connects Coventry, Leicester and Nottingham because you can't get between those three cities on a direct train. You can't do it. Um, and so we're working with Jim quite closely on that. Um, but like we meet every few months, but but there are certain occasions where councils will go, this isn't for us, this is not where our makeup is. Mm -hmm. Obviously local elections, that yeah. one has happened because someone took power and decided yeah. that wasn't their, their viewpoint. And that's absolutely fine. Um, you just have to make sure that you keep the work and, and then you, you go back in a few years. But obviously with things like inflation at the moment, mm -hmm. you know, that's having pressures on lots of projects because, mm -hmm. um, you know, overnight it's gone up 10% the contract so you know what was affordable three or four years ago might not be affordable now yeah no that's interesting so really it's it's so valuable isn't it in the work that you do to try and form those stakeholder relationships early have you got an example of where potentially you felt like you engaged early enough but it still wasn't good enough for for the for the, for the project that you wanted to get over the line or oh um so so we, we try most luckily touch wood most of our Local councils are, are relatively are relatively happy. I think there is always when you're dealing with an alphabet soup of 
government bodies, including us, there will always be moments where you will miss people and they'll be like, what on earth are you talking about? What's this? I've read it in the news. And I always touch wood, try and avoid that, that everyone knows before we say or do anything. But, you know, there are cases where, you know, we've, we've gone with projects uh, and we've tried to propose things and people have gone, we have a tangential, you know, foot in this, uh, foot in this camp and you probably didn't tell us as much as you should have done. Um, we try and avoid that, but usually when you're dealing with, when well, average road takes about five councils, one of the projects we might be talking about later is like the Midlands Rail Hub, and I think that's about 20. Um, and so there are councils outside my geographical remit, for example. So the project goes all the way down to Cardiff. So we deal with, th so I think it's five government departments to do with the Rail Hub. Um, and so, you know, you don't always tell everybody everything and you know sometimes you get told off but you have to try and have a slightly better and rigorous system but we don't always get it right but who does no, yeah absolutely and you you're right we do want to pick up about the uh, midlands rail hub so now the business case for that has been submitted what does sort of the roadmap to securing funding look like or what happens from here yeah so uh, the the outline business case went in in december and we, we launched it and i think some of your colleagues uh, kindly came uh, to the launch event. So it's gone in, it's gone into the DFT and it's working its way slowly through the government machinery. So it's going to the Treasury. Uh, the Treasury will make a decision uh, and decide whether they want to fund it to a full business case. Full business case is pretty much delivery. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and whether they want to fund that through something called, this is where we end up with acronyms and it drives me bonkers. So a thing called RNEP, which is the Rail Network Enhancements Pipeline. So what that is, is every year the government produce a list for rail nerds. I guess I fall into that now, but I really <laughs> wish I didn't. Um, so it's a list every year that says these are the projects, private sector, that we are going to build or fund or support. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping to get the Rail Hub into RNEP. Uh, it's about one and a half billion pounds. Um, and then... Uh, we can pretty much start cracking on. There's conversations already happening about uh, the land around Bordesley because we're going to build two cords, which are viaducts. Um, so there's conversations already happening with them because obviously you have to go through quite a lot of safeguarding processes, as I'm sure you guys will probably be very aware with. Um, and then there's also there's obviously a separate conversation that we're having because obviously looking slightly over the horizon, there's an election. Um, and there are early deliverables in the rail hub. So it's whether the government want to pull those early deliverables forward. So for example, there's a thing called Snow Hill Platform 4. If any of your listeners or you guys use Snow Hill, there's a platform that was used for the tram that's now not used. And our argument is you could spend it, it costs about 30 million pounds, uh, but you could bring that platform back into use and use that in about 18 months if you gave me the, if you gave me the go ahead today. Is that, are you allowed to do that? Um, I'm not really sure. <laughs> but right. Not quite yeah, in the ring. Right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> do, do you feel like the um, local elections coming up could possibly hinder the work that it is that you're trying to propose? So the, we're quite lucky with the Rail Hub. All the main political parties in, in places like Birmingham and others put it in their manifestos. So uh, your viewers who are watching this, when they voted in the manifesto for the transport section for all the parties had the Rail Hub in. Uh, what we try and do is we work with Chambers, LEPs and others when they put together their kind of council manifestos and they did it for the mayoral elections as well, is we try and make sure that our projects are seen by those organisations. So like the CBI, get badgered by people like me to say, these are these are our key schemes. So we're hoping the local elections will have a massive impact. Obviously, roads are a slightly different thing because yeah. uh, obviously, depending on what colour or combination you end up with, uh, some people have a, you know, I guess it's a valid viewpoint, but they have a, a view that they, they don't want road building. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's and that's a valid viewpoint, but obviously that then impacts on projects. Rail's a little bit different. I haven't found anybody so far who has a big problem with the rail hub, touch wood. Um, but like you know, we, what we try and do is we just try and do good engagement. So like local councillors and others will get emails from us saying. This is where we're up to. This is what we're doing. Do you want briefings as well as leaders and MPs and others? Mm -hmm. oh, that's helpful. And what do you feel like are some of the big challenges that the Midlands built environment may face over the upcoming? So you talked about it. So we've got an election coming. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a straightened financial uh, situation no matter who wins. Like there is literally no money. Um, <laughs> and even though I think in the, the last budget or autumn statement, the, the Chancellor uh, 
froze, like he didn't cut spending, but obviously with inflation, it is it is a cash cut. So, you know, you're trying to get all of the projects in with inflation at 10% or something. So it's hard. Um, and obviously that has a massive impact on people like us because we have to go and look at our portfolio of projects and go, can we still deliver them all? Um, obviously knowing what costs are. So that's, that's the biggest challenge. Obviously, if there isn't a, a different political party in power, they obviously have a different viewpoint. So, you know, we're doing quite a lot of early engagement with Labour. I was down there last week meeting the, the, the Treasury and the transport teams to say kind of what, what are you interested in? What can we work with you on? Uh, but, their, but their kind of priorities are very different. So if you talk to the government right now, hydrogen, literally, if you've got a hydrogen project or any of your clients do, you will know they are the zeitgeist. They are the thing of the hour. Um, whereas if you talk to Labour, they're like, okay, but we like electric vehicles um, and we like trains. Uh, whereas if you talk to the, you know, certain, you know, government MPs at the moment, back benches even, they want roads, build me a road. Yeah. You know, there's everyone has a McDonald's roundabout that they want improved, <laughs> it appears. Uh, there, are other, there are other, there are other, you know, <laughs> but like, that's the thing is that they obviously have different priorities. And then obviously, um, depending on what kind of, what the election looks like, obviously there are, there could be third, third or fourth party implications. So like, and again, that will have a massive impact is that, you know, you know, other political parties have very different views on things like decarbonisation. Uh, and, and, you know, that will then have to play into some of the projects that we do. So the election is probably at the top. Obviously, the financial situation and, and, and the budgets are, are, are there as well. Um, and then obviously, there's going to be a, no, a new cohort of of, of, of councils. So, for example, in the East Midlands, we're going to have a new mayoral authority yes. and a new yeah. mayor, uh, and a lot of councils are going through devolution. Mm -hmm. So, we might have either a load of mayors or counties that have their own devolution powers that we're having to get our head around. And it's like, where do we, where do we as Midlands Connect and fit into that kind of structure? Because at the moment, there's the West Midlands combined authority, and then a load of other councils yeah. and now it's going to be an east and west mm -hmm. and then sure. where do all the other councils fit in uh mm -hmm. and it starts to get a little bit more competent to a bit of a jigsaw doesn't it then yeah there's quite a lot of uh, adaptation that, that may need to be done a bit, for that. A little bit I think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely so i suppose you're starting to do this naturally there but sort of zooming out to the wider i suppose national context as well you know obviously your midlands connect so you deal with business cases for transport within the Midlands, but what impact do you think a better connected Midlands would have on overall UK, you know, economic prosper prosperity or access to sustainable transport forms? Like, how does that look like for you in terms of the Midlands playing the part in in the nation, really? So I'm going to be a dad here. I was reading a book to my daughter, and I was—I don't know if you watched like Gone on a Bear Hunt, like. Yeah, no, you're looking very going like confused. Potentially. Yeah, the book. Going on, oh, the book, going, yeah. The book, I going on a bear hunt. Watched, no, it's like, yeah, uh, it's like it, you yeah. can't, you have to go through the Midlands, is, is my point of what I'm trying to say here. Right. You can't <laughs> go around us, you can't go, you have to go through us. Yeah. So, so the big selling point of the Midlands is if you improve the infrastructure for the Midlands, you will improve it for the country. So, if you look at, so that was my, that was my very convoluted point there, apologies. Um, <laughs> so, like, the point is if you can improve the infrastructure, so for example, the rail hub, if we can improve, the infrastructure for the Midlands, we can then deal with delays on the national network because everyone right now listening, hopefully, uh, will have, well, hopefully not, but has probably had the pain of sitting outside New Street Station, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. And our plan is to fix that because we will create a King's Cross St Pancras in Birmingham. So you can get off a H to a HS2 train and you'll go to Moore Street because HS2 trains are so long mm -hmm. and you can then get on a better train because we've taken all the trains out of New Street. But what that then does is for a London to Scotland train, that will go quicker because it's not stuck at New Street. So my, my, my big point and what I say to, hopefully I'm not breaking confidences, but what, what I said to, to the new special advisors in the Department for Transport is, if you fix the Midlands, that has a national knock-on. So if you can, if you can deliver an, uh, hydrogen, let's pick hydrogen for example, if you can deliver a hydrogen corridor along the A50, A500 from JCB, uh, you know, through to Rolls-Royce or Toyota or Jaguar Land Rover, because they all have big factories there, that will have a national knock-on. If you can unlock the transport around a free port, you can, you can then help the country because, you know, DHL are the biggest, uh, biggest users of East Midlands Airport and they're going to use the free port to do lots of things. So, so that's our argument, basically, in a nutshell, is that you unlock the Midlands, you can help the country. 
Uh, and, you know, that's what you the same for everything. Roads, HS2, rail. Mm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Well, thank you so much for your thank time you. today. Um, really, really appreciate it. And really interesting to speak about the work that you do. And again, we always like linking. Yes, the Midlands are really important, but it's, it's so good to to really hammer home the role that Midlands Improvement brings to the rest of the country as well. We um, actually do have a bit of a tradition on the podcast oh, where great. we end the um, episode by passing on a question that we don't know what the question is, but it's been asked by our last guest. Right. Um, so it's in this sealed envelope here. So if you'd like to open it. No pressure. Um, it's usually on built environment topics. That's fine. Really Let's see what happens. Control. Right. And if you could read it out just for the listeners. Well, that'd be of course, fun. what is your biggest sustainability initiative which you work on or are involved in? So that's a very good question. So um, we are, we work, we've created this kind of toolkit basically. So uh, any council can come in and we can show where their carbon comes from. So if they come in, so let's say they're building up a, a new kind of Aldi or Lidl or other supermarket, um, we can show what, ro what the road network uh, will happen and what and what happens to the, the carbon, the not only the inbuilt carbon when you build it, but also the carbon of the traffic. So uh, that kind of carbon toolkit is being rolled out throughout the country potentially. Um, and the other thing we're doing is we have an app uh, for EVs. So you could go on your, your phone or whatever, you could download my app, although it's my colleague Richard's app. <laughs> and I get very annoyed with that. You can, but you can look up and it'll tell you where to put electric charge points uh, because of the power is very good there or there's lots of people that use it. Um, and so we're trying to do lots of different things like that to try and help tackle climate change. And they're, they're probably, am I allowed two? But they're my oh, two. Go for yeah, it. There you, you go. Right, there you go. <laughs> and, and is some of that based on like transport modelling? There's the idea of the projections of traffic flowing yeah. through the area. Yeah. So, so on, the, on the kind of carbon baseline, this is what the project's called, um, we look at how, where the trips are coming from. So we, we buy mobile phone data. Um, and so we see where your phone, your phone's on. Uh, we see where you're going from A to B, and then we we then put in, so say there's a new development, we'll then model in what the impact will be, because usually the the impact of a new development or a supermarket or a, you know, uh, it can be, can be factored in because there's so much previous examples, and we will show what happened to carbon in a certain area. So we can, so we, if we're asked, we can say, look, this is the impact of it, it's, it's fine, and as a result, you might want to think about extra bus provision, or you might want to think about put in an extra train, the train line might want to, you might want to have extra trains going X, Y, and Z as a result. So that's what we do. Yeah. Cool, thank you so much. Thank it's been really great chatting me. with you today. And um, thank you for those watching and listening to us today. Uh, we've been here at BCG Conversation Midlands Matters Podcast, and we really hope that you'll join us again next time. Take care. Thank you.